Hello again, Martin Braden here, and welcome to my channel. If this is your first time watching one of my videos and you find it to be interesting and worth your precious time, please take a moment before you leave and click on the like and subscribe buttons, as well as the notification bell, so that you'll be notified when my next video is posted. As you may or may not know, when you do this, you're helping my channel's content get exposed to a much larger audience, and that, of course, helps uplift many more viewers besides yourself. So thanks for doing that. In today's video, I'm going to be discussing why Latter-day Saints leave the church. In doing so, I'm going to refer to author and blogger Jana Reese's recent work titled, The Next Mormons, How Millennials Are Changing the LDS Church. For her book, Dr. Reese compiled important research that would, among other things, help our Christian friends better understand the mindset of both current Latter-day Saints like me, as well as former church members that have stepped away from the church. The survey Dr. Reese refers to in her book was professionally done and is multi-generational in its scope, making it extremely valuable to the millions of people belonging to the greatest generation born in 1927 and before, the silent generation born in 1928 through 1944, the baby, excuse me, baby boomer generation, hello, that's me, 1945 through 1964, I was born right in the middle at 1954. Generation X, 1965 to 1979, and the Millennial Generation, 1980 through 1998, each generation being pulled individually. The Generation Z's, or Z, born after 1999, was not included in her survey, which I would have loved to have had it been included, but it's not. Dr. Reese's groundbreaking multi-regional survey pulled 1,156 LDS and 540 former LDS of all ages and included both representative statistics as well as interviews on beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors of these generational groups. It includes both members and ex-members of the LDS Church, as I said. To start off with, Dr. Reese lays out the top 10 whys on her list. They come in from the survey stats, along with the percentage relating to each reason why. The percentage is of the total group polled. For example, number one, I could no longer reconcile my personal values and priorities with those of the church, 38%. And I think that's the cultural pull happening there. Number two, I stopped believing there was one true church, 36.5% of the total poll. I did not trust the church leadership to tell the truth surrounding controversial or historical issues, 31%. I felt judged or misunderstood, 30%. Or I just categorize that as maybe they were offended. Number five, I drifted away from attending the church uh, regularly or at all. Okay, they just stepped away, drifted away, 26%. Number six, I engaged in behaviors that the church views as sinful, 23%. In other words, the high demands of the church uh, they weren't able to live up to, I suppose. Number seven, the church's positions on LGBTQIA plus 23 issues, 23%. The church's position excuse me, or emphasis on conformity and obedience, 21%. Again, too orthodox, too high demand of religion. Number nine, lack of historical evidence for the Book of Mormon and or the Book of Abraham, 21%. So some of these groups um, have several of these 10. Doesn't mean it's all divided and there's only a certain group. You might have had four or eight or all 10, doesn't matter. Number nine, lack of historical evidence for the Book of Mormon and or Book of Abraham, 21%. And lastly, number 10, the role of women in the church, 18%. Now, let me give you Dr. Reese's brief definition for each of these whys. Number one, personal values priorities could no longer be reconciled. With a runaway culture that is more accepting of progressive values, including the acceptance and validity of homosexuality as well as live-in relationships with the opposite sex, among other things, the attitude of prioritizing secular humanistic ideas while abandoning faith affects not only those leaving the church but also those who abandon Christianity as well. That's her definition of what she's talking about, number one. Number two, stop believing in the concept of one true church. Pluralism, all spiritual paths lead to God, that's what that pluralism means, is more accepted in the 21st century now. Many, including those still in the LDS Church, feel it is narrow-minded to say that there is only one true church. They say, who are you to judge? As long as you are a good person, our common responses used against 
Christians who rightly say their genuine faith can only be found in a personal relationship with Christ as revealed in the Bible. Number three, leaders are not telling the truth. From 2013-15 on in there to 2015, the LDS Church published 13 essays on controversial topics such as Joseph Smith's polygamous and polyandrous ways, the Book of Abraham as a spiritual, not literal, translation, and the method used by Smith to translate the Book of Mormon with a magical seer stone, etc. Now these are Dr. Reese's words, they're not mine. I'm just kind of quoting her, and we'll get into that a little bit in a little while. Continuing, for many, these gospel topic essays included information they did not previously know. They did not previously know, even though the facts have been readily available from sources such as mrm.org, and I'd say such as the Ensign or the Proven Area or whatever. I mean, I remember back in the 80s uh, seeing stuff about the, you know, four or five versions of the Joseph Smith story or, or accounts of it, and, and a lot of people say, I never was taught that. They hid it from me. They lied. I read it just as a teen, you know. <laughs> so, anyhow, some felt betrayed because they were not taught the truth in their local congregations before 2013. Now, that may be the case in their experience. I don't know it for sure, but that's what they're saying. This has certainly led to further distrust in church leaders. Number four, they felt judged or misunderstood. Related to the first point, those who decided to live my way no longer wanted to be get, you know, get judged by leaders and other members in their congregations. They may have become tired of hiding their coffee, their alcohol intake, disinterest in getting temple recommends, and a lack of church participation, etc., etc. Number five, drifted away from the church. Those things emphasized in the LDS Church, including fulfilling church callings, attending the temple regularly, and practicing the word of wisdom, became less of a priority for these folks. This can easily happen to those, she says, who experience any of the four prior reasons. Yeah, I guess. Number six, engaged in sinful behaviors. Activities prohibited by the church became more attractive to these folks. The person who leaves for this reason either does not want to play the hypocrite or get judged because of it. Many Latter-day Saints see this as the main reason for them leaving the church, she says. Number seven, LGBTQIA plus 23 issues. This issue has become a lightning rod for the church's leaders who have maintained that marriage is reserved for one man and one woman. If the church ever decided to change its policy and allow homosexual marriages in the temple, it would involve a complete revamping of the traditional idea that only nuclear families can reside in the celestial kingdom forever. Again, please keep in mind this is uh, Dr. Reese's wording, not mine. In addition, a third of all LDS or Latter-day Saints did not agree with the 2015 LGBTQ exclusion policy. Okay? the 2015 exclusion policy that banned children of homosexual parents from being allowed to get baptized. Although this policy changed several years later, it is still brought up by disaffected, excuse me, former members of the church to this very day. Number eight, conformity, obedience. Younger generations especially are attracted by individuality, read to yourself in other words, and are less likely to get in line with what their leaders tell them to do. Number nine, problems with the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham. This is the top historical issue for why people leave the church, or so Dr. Reese is saying here from what her uh, survey exposed. Number 10, women in the church. Many feminist members are pressuring their leaders to allow females to hold the LDS priesthood uh, power and authority currently held by males only. Well, that's a males only thing. I suppose being ordained a, a deacon, a priest, a teacher, an elder, a 70, a high priest, those offices, maybe, but the women do have an exercise of priesthood authority all the time. They have the power of the priest in everything that they do, but this is just how she's defining it, and so I'm going to read it as such, and we'll talk about it later. More than half of these top 10 reasons involve non-biblical and non-historical issues. As Dr. Reese explains, overall personal and social reasons outweighed any specific doctrinal concerns. As mentioned in the first point, this can be attributed to the ever-changing culture in all societies across the globe. The polarization of societies that has become more liberal and less God-fearing in recent years. As active Latter-day Saints, you might be surprised with this list if you're an active member of the church today. 
For one, you probably thought that the sixth reason, sinful behavior, this is her speaking still, would have been rated higher. Another popular assumption held by many Latter-day Saints for why people leave the church is that they were offended in some way. Be it being hurt by fellow members or by ecclesiastical leaders, this point is listed as the 11th reason given in Reese's poll. 17% have this feeling. Now, besides the problem with the Book of Mormon and the Book of Abraham, and it's, as it's mentioned in number 9, other historical issues were also listed from the survey. Reason number 12, Joseph Smith's polyandry, which is sealing himself to women who were already married. 16% had the problem. 13, multiple and somewhat conflicting accounts of the first vision. I mentioned that earlier. 12% had that issue. 15, restriction of ordaining the priesthood and administering the temple endowment to members of African descent before 1978 when that revelation came to President Kimball. 10% have an issue. 16, seer stones in a hat. The story of the Joseph looking into the hat and so that he could get the light enough in, when they block out the round the light and see the light of that seer stone or Urman Thummim. That's all an issue used in translating the Book of Mormon, 6.5%. Number 17, DNA evidence that Native Americans do not have Middle Eastern ancestry. Apparently there seems to be no known DNA markers showing this is in Native Americans. 3% have an issue with that. This is me speaking now. Perhaps the most disheartening of this, all these statistics for me mentioned in Dr. Reese's book are those concerning or relating to the fate of former members who leave the church. This is going to be very interesting and sad to me. But anyhow, according to Dr. Reese, just under half, just barely under half, 44%, have not become involved with another religious tradition since leaving the church. These are represented under the categories of atheist, agnostic, and nothing in particular. Another fifth, 21%, consider themselves just Christian, but do not specifically or participate in a particular church, which likely means they have retained Christian beliefs, a love for God and, and for Jesus, but are not regular attenders of any church. The remaining third, 33%, now identify as something else, mostly remaining within the Christian orbit. This is close to half of all former Latter-day Saint members choosing to not be involved with any or another religious tradition. In other words, uh, and these are my words again, they were willing to exchange the one true church for absolutely nothing at all. For me, this statistic resonates and sadly so with the saying that says, if the LDS church isn't true, then nothing else is. Dr. Reese says this is a neither rational nor true statement. If the church isn't true, she says, then something else has to be, right? After all, nothing is not something. If the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints isn't true, perhaps Hinduism is, or Islam, or Catholicism. Or maybe God doesn't exist, which would validate atheism, a belief held by some that there is no true and living God. In other words, they simply believe that God does not exist. As I said in my book, An Atheist Delusion, atheism is something. Some believe that it is possible that we are living in a matrix like uh, type illusion, and therefore nobody exists. The list of possibilities could go on and on and on, but the point is, whatever ends up as being true, it cannot be nothing at all. Reese continues, other possibilities, especially biblical Christianity, ought to be one of the considerations former Latter-day Saints who leave the church. They should consider that at least. This is me again. If they can't accept the restored gospel, then it would be my hope that they have a foundation to set their new belief table, whatever it is, on that um, that will bring them peace and happiness in their lives. That's what I hope for them. This is especially true for those who felt that at one time they really did know Jesus as their Savior. That said, even more alarming to me is the statistic that says that very few of these former Latter-day Saints end up as Christians. Out of 33% who identify as something else, 11% now belong to other religions, 10% became Evangelical Protestants, 7% are Mainline Protestants, and 6% are Roman Catholics. When the totals for Evangelical and Mainline Protestants are added together, it's just 5% of those who left the church. This number is too low in my estimation, especially since there are more former members who end up as atheists and agnostics than Christians. Man, it appears that many weary Latter-day Saints are burned out. And they want nothing to do with religion, especially Christianity in any of its forms. But it's usually a descent to that after they leave. 
I remember hearing this story. Well, I won't go into those uh, anti-Mormons, ex-Mormons that tell that story, but it starts out hating the church. They're angry. They felt deceived and they get whatever. And then they work out through Christianity and they find that the same reason they used to, to derail the church in their mind, they need to hold up to Christianity and they've done the same and they end up as atheists. Anyhow, let me mention again that Jana Reese is a popular LDS blogger who has degrees from revered schools such as Princeton Theological Seminary and Columbia University where she earned, earned her PhD in religion. That probably was a fun several years of full on more study. I bet she enjoyed that. She is a senior columnist, columnist for Religion News Service. Her book, The Next Mormons, How Millennials Are Changing the LDS Church, right here. Right there. Is a scholarly research book that Dr. Reese published by Oxford University Press back in March of 2019. With all of this as a backdrop for this video, let's get into it and consider how Dr. Reese's research might help you, my viewers, and myself to better understand the Latter-day Saint mindset, as well as what the survey may be saying, may be saying about the world in which we live now. The first question that comes to my mind after reading all of this is, does this survey affirm what all the past and current prophets prophesied about our time, it being the dispensation of the fullness of time. In other words, our society zeitgeist. Dr. Reese lists the five generational categories she addresses throughout her book. I'm going to repeat them. First is the generation called Greatest Generation, 1927 and before. Next is the Silent Generation, 1928 through 1944. Next is the Baby Boomer Generation, 1945 to 1964. Hello, I'm a baby boomer. And then the Generation X, 1965 through 1979. And next, the Millennial Generation, 1980 through 1998. And lastly is the Gen Z Generation, 1999 and after. Dr. Reese provides a chart that shows a comparison with the Boomer, Gen X, and Millennials on unique LDS teachings. Let me see if I can pull this out here. I hope you can see it. I'm going to pull it back so you can see it all. Again, if you want any of these pictures or files, whatever, just email me, marty.braden at gmail.com, and I'll send the entire group to you so you have it for your little records. But anyhow, the chart explains what the difference uh, generations between members who are confident and believe these truth claims to be true. In other words, those who believe these truth, what's the spread? What's the difference? And that's what that chart discusses. So um, I'm just going to go ahead and read it for a minute. You can look at it. It says, priesthood given to men and not women. Boomers, 57%, believe it. Gen X. 46% and millennials, 41%. That's a 16% drop. <laughs> Case, Joseph Smith is a prophet of God. 67% of boomers. Man, I, so what's the other 33% believing in? Members of the church. Good honk in the morning. Okay, 67% boomers. Uh, Generation X is 54% and millennials is 51%. LDS first pregnancy are prophets, seers, and revelators living today. 67% boomers believe it. 55%. Just over half of Generation X. <laughs> and Millennials, 53%. At least it's 50% or more. Goodness gracious. God is exalted person of flesh and bone. Boomers, 68%. 55% Generation X and 55% Millennials. The Book of Mormon came from a literal historical document. 62%, 53%, and 50%. LDS Church is the only true church. Well... 62%, 53%, and 50%. LDS Church is the only true church is a pretty straightforward thing. It either is, or it's kind of like telling a, a, a woman, you're either pregnant or not. You can't be 55% pregnant. I mean, <laughs> goodness. Sealing ordinances are the only way for families to be together for eternity. That doctrine, of the boomers, 56% of them believe it. 49%, now it's getting underneath. Uh, 50% Gen X believes, and Millennials, 49%. This is another interesting one. The priesthood and temple ban on those of African descent was inspired by God. I don't know if I would put the term inspired by God. Was commanded by God, which is a little different than just inspiration. 44% of boomers, so that is 56% don't. 30% means 70% don't, so Gen X, 30%. And yet, what's odd, it went up for the millennials. 37%, so 7% more than the 30%. I thought that was fascinating. Anyhow, that's one chart. If you want it, I'll certainly give that to you. 
There seems to be, as I said, a huge drop-off in true blues beliefs between boomers and the Generation Xers, even before the millennials are considered. Now, granted, the Gen Xers are considered a little more spiritual when, it is, when they're put up next to the millennials by a percentage point or two, like I said, that one. But there is much less of a drop-off between the Gen Xers and the millennials than the boomers and the Gen Xers. The one why exception is with that priesthood when I just, just said. Now, more than one out of three millennials believe that this doctrine was inspired by God. That's 33%. Only one in three uh, Latter-day Saint millennials. I would have thought that millennials' number um, percentage would have gone much further down rather than beat the generation exposition by a positive seven percentage points. Anyhow, <clears throat> excuse me, these statistics related to the church's core beliefs are very troubling to me. But it's not surprising to me. It's not surprising. As I said, they are the core concepts of the LDS Church that are being denied by more than half of the Latter-day Saint millennials. The second or middle generation between the boomers and the Gen Zers. Okay, they have the one here, the one here, and they're the middle one. Okay, this generation then has children, the next generation coming up, and then those have children, the next generation coming up. We're going to talk about something very interesting here in a moment. Take, for instance, the historicity of the historicity, excuse me, of the Book of Mormon. The Book of Mormon is a sacred record of some of the people who lived on the American continents between about 2000 BC and AD 400, uh, Dr. Reese says. It contains the fullness of the gospel of Jesus Christ. You can see in DNC 20 verse 9, DNC 42 verse 12, and DNC 135 3 for that basic general statement. The Book of Mormon tells of the visit Jesus Christ made to the people in the Americas soon after his resurrection. Gospel Principles, 2009, page 46. Van Hill, an LDS apologist, agreed with this assessment, stating in 2005, More than 20 years ago, I concluded that my belief, he said, in the Book of Mormon as a divinely inspired book of Scripture did not require that it be an accurate, detailed translation of an ancient history. Van Hill, host of Mormon uh, Miscellaneous, a radio broadcast that aired February 6, 2005. Yet Latter-day Saint scholars and apologists appear to disagree with Mr. Hale. For instance, former BYU professor Robert Millett stated, quote, The historicity of the Book of Mormon record is crucial. We cannot exercise faith in that which is true, nor can doctrinal fiction have normative value in our lives. Too often the undergirding assumption of those who cast doubt on the historicity of the Book of Mormon in whole or in part is the denial of the supernatural and a refusal to admit of revelation and predictive prophecy. And that's in Selective Writings by Dr. Millet. So, it's like what is stated in the Lectures on Faith. I love that. I've got a beautiful um, special edition of Lectures on Faith with lots of commentary. I just loved the Lectures on Faith, and several commentaries on the nature of God. If God didn't have the divine attributes in perfect uh, perfection that he does have them, man could not rely on or have faith in him as God. In other words, if there's one little flaw, whoop, it could go to zig and it shouldn't have zagged. Another LDS apologist, Louis Midgley, explained, There is no middle ground on the question of whether the Book of Mormon is an authentic ancient text or it's not. There's no middle ground. On this, but not, of course, on every issue, we are confronted with an either-or possibility. There is nothing in the Book of Mormon or in Joseph Smith's account of its coming forth that suggests that it should be read as anything other than historical fact. That's um, Historicity of the Latter-day Saint Scriptures by Paul Yoskison. Okay? Amazingly, only 5 out of 10 LDS millennials believe in a literal history of the Book of Mormon. My goodness! This reminds me of the Book of Mormon stating that the next generation did not believe in the traditions of their fathers. In Mosea 26.1 it says, quote, Now it came to pass that there were many of the rising generation that could not understand the words of King Benjamin, being little children at the time he spake unto his people, and they did not believe the tradition of their fathers. The baby boomers are not uh, that much better, this um, book says, uh, Dr. Reese. Six out of ten Latter-day Saint baby boomers agree with LDS millennials. <laughs> oh my goodness. Let me pull this little chart out. Why don't you look at this for a minute? See if you can see that pretty good. Hold it up here and straight. I'm going to read it. Uh, I, you should go to Jared Halverson's Unshaken YouTube channel and call up, come follow me, Mosiah 7 through 10, Lost and Found. 
in it, he gives uh, and talks about the generational pendulum that swings back and forth from generation one to generation two, that gets way over here to jump back to generation three. Notice the mindsets, he said. Immigration, preservation, identity is gener generation one. Second generation, assimilation, rejection, counter identity. I don't want nothing to do with those baby boomers. Those, oh my goodness, they didn't know what they're talking about. They're way too extreme. Talk about high demand. That, that's just ridiculous. Third generation, looking nostalgically back at the first and the kid that they did, and the extreme penalty where it brought them. And so they want to return. So that's a, quite a wonderful discussion he has. It's just fantastic. I ask you this. It is, is it even possible to believe in a fictional book of Mormon and still be considered a faithful Latter-day Saint? Is it even possible to believe in a fictional book of Mormon and still be considered a faithful Latter-day Saint? Well, there's been some historians for the Church of Jesus Christ who believe just that and stayed in the church. I question what their motives were because of what I saw and heard and have read and studied that they put into place and that the new historian type philosophy. To me, what this statistic is saying is that nobody can assume that their LDS friends believe in the historical Book of Mormon. You can't assume that anymore. You need to ask because more than half, maybe, don't, and they're still members of the church. Anyhow. Our Christian friends should ask their earliest friends, uh, Dr. Reese says, do you believe the Book of Mormon to be a historical book? Or do you believe it is just a fictional book with good moral teachings? True, history is everything for those who believe the Bible and the events it records. After all, Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13, excuse me, 15, verses 13, 15, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God. Wow! To translate that principle to our day, I say if the Book of Mormon is not an ancient record of the ex exodus of a Hebrew family from Jerusalem, then the Church of Jesus Christ claimed that Jesus himself restored it and its gospel is a fraud. And if that's true, then its members are false witnesses of a non-existent God. Hmm. In my opinion, any Latter-day Saint who sacrifices the historicity of the Book of Mormon as being just a book written by man with a good moral code is putting themselves in a very, very precarious position. Dr. Reese goes on to provide several reasons why so many Latter-day Saints are still holding on to their faith. I don't know. I, I, I didn't have difficulty with Dr. Reese because she's having her own study and her life and what she believes and that. But it's her, her philosophy, her mindset starting to come through here. First is family. Those of us who are trying to be quick to observe have noticed that family attachments help keep many Latter-day Saints from leaving the faith of their youth. Many Latter-day Saints are careful not to anger or disappoint parents, grandparents, children, siblings, and friends. Family heritage and tradition can take precedence over truth, Dr. Reese says. She continues, while there is no perfect formula for raising children who remain devout in adulthood, especially given the unprecedented rapid disaffiliation of the millennial generation as a whole, sticking with the beliefs of the family provides the best chance for a successful transference of a religious identity from one generation to the next. Is that just what we're doing, a transferring of things? I guess you look at it as a 30,000 point of view, a foot view, but anyhow. So, Hanson's Law, keep that in mind. Next on Dr. Reese's list as another reason why so many of the latter saints are still holding on to their faith, says number two, a college education. According to Dr. Reese, a college education appears to provide a modest boost toward greater belief in religious activity. For example, nearly two-thirds of Latter-day Saints holding a college degree are confident that the Latter-day Saints' first pregnancy members and apostles are God's prophets on the earth today. They believe that, two-thirds, 66%. But under half of those with a high school education agree. So it's only those that have a high school degree, you know, 63 versus 48%. It's less than half. An even wider gap separates those groups on the question of whether Jesus Christ was literally resurrected from the dead. 74% of Latter-day Saints in her survey with a college degree say they know this is true, compared to just 50% of those who did not attend college. 
it seems sensible that the higher achievers in the family usually go on to college and generally are more conforming. That's her opinion. The next reason is number three, seminary attendance. Seminary is the four-year program run by the church to educate high school students on the church's beliefs. For most Latter-day Saint teens, a one-hour class daily, usually held at a local Latter-day Saint building before the school uh, day is available for interested students throughout the country. In Utah and Idaho, however, release time classes are available throughout the school day at a church building located near the high school. That's how mine was in Boise. Students go off uh, the public school grounds to participate in their approved class. This program has been very successful for the Latter-day Saint Church, as reported by Dr. Reese. Seminary attendance is positively correlated with a number of outcomes she says Mormon leaders would consider desirable. People who attend seminary regularly are more likely to later serve a mission, for example, and to get married in the temple. When they reach adulthood, they re uh, report higher levels of church activity and stronger levels of belief from Mormons who did not attend seminary. Duh! Learning, studying, reading scriptures, getting the information, backing up the feelings and the convicting to your knower, those things. Of course, you have a greater desire to go on a mission or want to marry in the temple when you know the gospel. Anyhow, six in ten, she says, of Latter-day Saint millennials participated in seminary, 60%, when they were in high school, compared to just one-third of former Latter-day Saint respondents of the same generation. Hmm. Among high school students who are already Sunday worshipers, seminary appears to provide something extra that helps to cement a Latter-day Saint identity. Number four, geography. Where the Latter-day Saint lives, uh, lives makes a difference to the average Latter-day Saint as to whether or not the person is in line with the church and its teachings. Reese explains, in a nutshell, quote, Mormons are often, but not always, more theologically orthodox. Utah Latter-day Saints were about 20% more likely to agree with that statement. I believe wholeheartedly in all of the teachings of the Latter-day Saint Church, 56 to 46%. Attend seminary for all years, 67 to 57%. That's between those two groups. Be active in the church, 62 versus 52. Hold a temple recommend, 63 versus 47. And say families are forever is one of three favorite parts of being Latter-day Saints, 64% to 47%. Another interesting statistic is that 37% of non-Utah Latter-day Saints chose to strong, excuse me, chose the strong community they call the church and that they enjoy at church as one of their favorite aspects of being a Latter-day Saint. But only 15% of Utah members felt that way. I was really confused by that one, so I'm not sure that's correct, but that's what it said in the book. Number five, doubters. The vast majority of current Latter-day Saints don't doubt when it comes to their faith, or at least that's what they say. Dr. Reese writes, quote, Only about 17% of respondents who still identify as Latter-day Saints expressed even a moderate degree of doubt in the teachings of the LDS Church. Well, that's a good statement. While about one in six self-identified as Latter-day Saints in the United States claims a degree of doubt. Only about 1 in 10 active members who attend church weekly and about 1 in 20 of those with current temple ranks expressed doubt in some, most, or all of the church's teachings. <sighs> doubt, the thicket of doubt. Number 6, millennials in the mission field. Compared to boomers and Generation Xers, the millennials are more likely to have served missions. In fact, more than half of the Latter-day Saint millennials have served a full-time mission, 55%. Compared to Generation Xers, only 40%, 60% don't. And boomers, silent generation, 28%. In fact, two-thirds of Latter-day Saint young men in the 1990s did not serve. Perhaps because the age for females was lowered in 19, to 19 in 2012, close to half of millennial females served a mission compared to 13% for the boomers and 28% for the Gen Xers. As Dr. Reese writes, before the age uh, change, about one in six young missionaries were female. Today, it's closer to one in three. Way to go, millennials. We have heard many Latter-day Saint young people tell us that they are motivated to go on a mission because of duty. This is interesting because duty would seem not to be as big of an incentive for Protestant missionaries who are more apt to say, I want to communicate with God's truth to those who do not have it, or we should love, love people with the gospel. No, it's not some duty-type thing, bound thing, but that 
belief and love for God is the main motivation in him. Serving a mission is directly proportional to a Latter-day Saint remaining faithful, especially if they had a good experience growing up in the church. Dr. Reese says, among respondents who had less than weekly church attendance in childhood, less than weekly, only 19% who completed a full-time mission are no longer Latter-day Saints. In, order, uh, in other words, 8 in 10, 80% of people who had been less active as kids were still members in adulthood if they had served a full-time mission. Retention is even stronger among those who were weekly attenders during childhood. Only 9% of those who were active growing up and served a full-time mission are no longer members today. Compared to 29% who served a partial mission and nearly half, 45%, who didn't serve at all. Okay, number seven, the temple experience. Fewer Latter-day Saint millennials hold to uh, current temple recommends today when compared to older age groups, my group and so forth. Less than half, 47%, have their recommend, which is fewer than the boomers, 58%, and Generation, X, Generation Gen Xers, excuse me, 52%. Reese explains, a related area of concern for church leaders is how few millennials hold a current temple recommend. In fact, they are the only generation the only generation of Latter-day Saints for whom fewer than half, 47%, are fully qualified to enter the temple. It's not just because they're young, either given that four out of five, four out of five, excuse me, given that four out of five, 83%, say they've held a temple recommend at some point in their lives. Okay, so active, current, using, recommends, interesting. That's actually higher than Generation Xers, 79%, or the Boomer Silent Group, 75%. But millennials are more likely to have allowed that temple recommend to lapse. That's what it's saying. Latter day Saint millennials are more likely to have held a temple recommend but no longer have it. Dr. Reese says, Well, I wonder if that has something to do with their first experience, not prepared for it. Blow them away. Too, too ceremonially rich with coronation. Oh, wow. Whereas almost 9 in 10, 90%, boomer silent responders. 87% have returned to the temple on behalf of the deceased, just over half of millennials, 56% had, and 6 in 10, 60% generation extras, or 59%. For the boomer silent respondents, temple attendance appears to be more of a priority for them. It seems that a number of members under 52 have attended the temple once for their own ordinances, possibly to get married, but have not returned. I, I, I suspect that's true. I don't get it, but I suspect it's true. But I also suspect that maybe their culture and the influence and their experience, they didn't ra be raised as a king, a prince or a princess in England, learning all that stuff or preparing for them to become kings and queens. It's just, you know, they're, they're playing on games and going to football and watching uh, NFL and all that kind of thing. And then I'll send into that highly symbolic environment. I can, I guess, I don't know, I'm assuming. Perhaps the reason why so many LDS millennials, Dr. Reese says, is have had a temple recommend at one point in their lives is because more than half went on a mission and a recommend was required. Could this be the reason why church leaders decided in April of 2019 to no longer deny those who decide to get married outside the temple the ability to get married for eternity right away? In other words, not this one year or more longer wait. Previously, there had been a year wait, she says, um, waiting period for those getting married outside the temple before they could get sealed in the temple. Of strictly protecting and helping and preparing and giving them time to prepare is what that was. So their testament get more deepened because it is a culture shock going there before the environment is beautiful, the things, but the experience and the uh, symbolism and the things that are the rites and rituals that have gone through to teach and learn about. The plan of happiness is not your everyday routine in seminary. Anyhow, this policy change now erases the excuse that, she says, we want to let everyone experience our wedding and procrastinate their temple work. We have no statistic to support this theory, but I'm sure there are more couples who participate in an outside ceremony who are now getting sealed inside the temple, probably within the week. So this is Dr. Reese saying, number eight, marriage. When it comes to marriage, American Latter-day Saints are still more likely to be married than the rest of the population. That's true. We love family. We love the, the idea of having an eternal companion. She says about 65% of Latter-day Saints are married compared to 48% for the U.S. adults, less than 50%. 65%. Uh, so you're talking, I don't know, 17% more Latter-day Saints want to get married.
Dr. Reese writes, Latter-day Saints, then, are about a third more likely to be married than members of the general population, which is statistically very significant. I agree. However, the percentage of Latter-day Saints who are married has gone down from 71% in 2007 to the mid-60s today. Hmm, that's more than a 10% drop. In addition, more Latter-day Saints have never married, going from 12% in 2007 to 19% today. That's not a good trend. Meanwhile, the median age for Latter-day Saints to marry is holding steady at around age 22. In other words, Latter-day Saints who do get married waste no time in tying that knot. I had 13 months and I was married when I got off my mission. They are bucking the larger national trend of delayed marriage. When it comes to traditional complementary marriage compared to egalitarian marriage sets up, set ups, younger Latter-day Saints are, preferred, are preferring the latter option. Reese writes, while the majority of Latter-day Saints prefer a traditional marriage, it's more popular among men, 65%, than among women, 58%. General, excuse me, generationally, there is change afoot. Nearly half, 48%, of millennial women want the egalitarian marriage, and we see movement toward the non-traditional even within that generation of women. For younger millennial women, 18 to 26, egalitarian marriage carries the majority at 54%. But 6 in 10 younger millennial men prefer the traditional arrangement, creating a gap between what young Latter-day Saint women want from their prospective marriage partners and what those men appear to be willing to offer. A few paragraphs later, Dr. Reese explains in her book the isolation that some single Latter-day Saint men may feel. For those who are uh, older single males, this causes real problems. One Latter-day Saint man said that he rarely receives invitations to social events that involve families. Some people don't want you to be around kids because they think you're a pedophile or something. That's so sad. My goodness. While married women can't be friends with you because that would be inappropriate. This means that overall, if you are an older single man in a family ward, you are likely uh, pretty isolated. As Dr. Reese reports, single people are more likely to leave the church or become inactive than married couples. And you can certainly understand why. I don't overall. The gospel is the most beautiful thing on the world. <laughs> Anyhow, whereas two-thirds of married adults members report having attended church in the last six, which mean the last month, 64% have reported. Fewer than half of unmarried Mormons or unmarried Latter-day Saints have attended, 48%. Meanwhile, daily scripture reading is claimed by 42% of married Latter-day Saints, but only 31% of singles, an 11-point drop. Married Latter-day Saints are 16 points more likely to believe wholeheartedly in all the Latter-day Saint teachings, 50%, compared to the singles Mormons at 38%, and 20 points more likely to have seen general conference in the last six months. In other words, they sat down on Saturday morning and got in front of that boob tube and looked at the, the beginning of conference starting 10 a.m., and then it's two hours, the break, two hours, a break, Two hours a break, Sunday morning, two hours a break, Sunday afternoon, two hours a break. That's, that's uh, tw you know, what is that? Two, five times two, you know, five plus two is seven times. Two hours is 14 hours. 38 percent, you know. Could this dissatisfaction with those who are single stem from the fact that church leaders highly stress marriage to their followers? With the temple not being fully accessible until a couple gets married, how many Latter-day Saint singles just give up and become less interested with their faith when a suitable partner never makes a grand appearance? I have my heart goes out for the singles um, and for those beautiful women who have not found a partner and are past the age now of bearing children and the same with men. It's just, I don't have the answers. I'm sure though the balance of this uh, contrary will come into their lives in the millennium and this will become faded, but for right in the heat of the battle, I can't imagine the tears and the pain. And some just don't want to ever have it, and that's not painful for them, but I'm speaking of those that I know that have uh, kept their faith and struggled through that experience of their life. We must also wonder if those singles who uh, like being, there are some that like being single and no longer feel wanted and lose much of their self-esteem because of this situation. Next is number nine, LDS women versus men. 
it should not be a surprise that the poll revealed, Dr. Reese says, how women are stronger in their LDS faith than men. Duh! <laughs> that, that's true. That one's true. According to the NMS, LDS women are a bit more likely than LDS men to pray and read their scriptures daily. Praying daily, reading scriptures daily, humbling ourselves, repenting daily. That's not a, apparently that's not a consistent thing for men. And very few watch General Conference, steer clear of R-rated movies and see sacrament meetings as uplifting and interesting, and hold a current temple recommend. That's quite a little list. Mormon women are also nine points more likely to strongly agree that being Mormon is an essential part of their core identity, being a Latter-day Saint and a disciple of Christ, and more likely to feel proud if a fellow Latter-day Saint were elected president of the United States. In multiple measures of belief and belonging, then women appear to be more orthodox than men. Hmm. When it came to questions about the authority of women in the church, the boomer slash silent LDS generation disagree with the Gen Xers and millennials, responding to the question that asked, the fact that women do not hold the priesthood sometimes bothers me. Only a quarter of an older generation, 55% or older, strongly or somewhat agree, while most than, more than half, or almost half, excuse me, 48%, of the Gen Xers, and more than half, 59%, of the Millennials agreed, which is more than double. Responding to the question, women do not have enough say in the LDS Church, fewer than a third of the older Mormons agreed, but more than half, 52% of the Gen Xers and 61% of Millennials agreed with that statement. Number 10, racial diversity in the Church. While the Latter-day Saint Church presents itself as racially diverse, it remains a very White religion in the United States, according to the NMS, 87% of the Latter-day Saints are white. By the way, the MNS is a short uh, little um, uh, word for her book, okay? And that, of course, that name of that book, I said, was The Next Mormon, The Next Mormons, is what it, she's written, it's that survey. Okay, with only 4% who are black and 4% are Hispanic Latino in the church. However, there is more diversity in the uh, Latter-day Saint millennial generation. While 93% of the Mormon boomer silent generations are white, only 81% of the Latter-day Saint millennials are. However, even that number pales when all millennials are considered as 4, uh, as four in 10, 40% nationwide, are non-white. Reese goes on to explain, it's in politics where we see the greatest divergence. Non-white Latter-day Saints are significantly to the left of white Latter-day Saints. Six, um, 68% voted for a supported Barack Obama in 2012. I don't know if you got that, but I guess it's part of that survey. Versus 30, 31% of white Latter-day Saints. Two-thirds are also backed, also backed Hillary Clinton in 2016. Consistent with these election patterns, a majority of non-white Latter-day Saints say they vote Democratic or lean toward the Democratic parties. 58% do. When it comes to the pre-June 1978 ban on blacks holding the priesthood, about one-third of all Latter-day Saints, of all Latter-day Saints, regardless of their generation, sex, or skin color, think that this doctrine was not inspired of God or God's will for the church before 1978. I don't know how true of that polling um, number that she did. Um, it's an interesting thing to say that they don't believe in that, or because the whole history has not been. I, I'll just leave it right there because I come from that boomer group, and I I don't understand it, but I I think there was prophets who it wasn't just one, it wasn't just Brigham, um, Joseph Smith gave the priesthood to to blacks in his day and sent um, missions and things. And then it picked up in this terrible situation with uh, um, the explosion and going clear to the other part of the, the, the hemisphere to be free to live as we wanted. And this, this ban on priesthood with prophet after prophet after prophet sustaining that and that kind of thing leads you to feel that there was a reason that the Lord himself, I don't know if it's to protect the, the members of the church or to protect the blacks in some way, knowing that they'll get a full blessing later on. I don't know the real things, but I do feel there was some of that there because I believe in Brigham Young being a prophet. I don't think he was racist, in my opinion. Now, Dr. Reese wrote, Mormon's faith in this particular Latter-day Saint teaching was significantly lower than the credence they attach to every other testimony statement. I guess she's referring to me, I don't know. The fact that only 37% of current Latter-day Saints said they knew it was true is downright lukewarm compared to their certainty on other testimony statements. 
Well, maybe that's your judgment, Doctor, that you uh, say that some are wishy-washy. And I suppose there's some. I'm not wishy-washy about it. But like the number who know confidently that God is real, or Jesus Christ is the Savior of the world and died to reconcile humanity to its sins, 70% believe that, but this 37% thing shows that there's some waffling going on, so I'll give her that. Compared to that, a far lower number of Latter-day Saints are certain that the priesthood temple ban was inspired. They're not that sure about it, I suppose. At least out of that 14, 1500 she polled. Perhaps one of the most fascinating findings was the breakdown between races, she said. According to the NMS, more black Latter-day Saints are confident that the ban was God's will compared to the view of whites, she explained. That's a flip-flop, isn't it? There is a slight difference in certainty when in, we break the data out by race, but it's more modest than I was expecting. Whereas 37% of white Latter-day Saints say they know the ban was God's will, just under a third, 32% of non-white Latter-day Saints view it this way. When we add together those who know with confidence that the ban was God's will with those who believe it was, more non-white Latter-day Saints than white ones actually support the ban. 70% of non-whites compared to 61% of whites. Interesting. Maybe their heart's telling them something there. And that others don't because they're feeling guilty. That guilt that you have, maybe, that's been promoted in our generation today. That also remains true when we consider only African-American respondents in a group by themselves. 67% of African-Americans know or believe that priesthood temple ban was God's will, which is six points higher than the rate for whites. That's an interesting part of her study. Okay, number 11, homosexuality and sexuality. Since 2013, Latter-day Saints have become more accepting of homosexuality at an excuse me, exponentially quick rate. Based on whether homosexuality should be accepted by society, Dr. Reese explains, Overall, Latter-day Saint acceptance of homosexuality grew from 24% in 2007 to 36% in 2014 and 48% in the 2016 NMS. Now, I will say this, that her wording, acceptance of homosexuality, Okay, acceptance of the people, acceptance of their state of mind, that it is definitely there, acceptance of that it's growing in population, that um, acceptance of a homosexuality that it's okay to actively break the law of chastity. If she's saying that, I 100% disagree. I'm not able to break the heterosexual uh, law of chastity as a heterosexual. I, I can't break the law of chess as a heterosexual. It breaks God's law. And those that have a mindset of homosexuality that break the law of chastity, they've broken a commandment. But I don't I accept them as, as their states of mind. I mean, we're of all variety of states of mind, and I love all of God's children. It's keeping the law of chastity is the question here. But I don't think that's what she's saying. I could be wrong, but I think that I don't think that's what she's saying. The view of homosexual marriage reached a tipping point, she says, between 2015 and 2016. In 2015, two-thirds of Latter-day Saints, 66%, opposed same-sex marriage. And I'm saying that the same-sex marriage is putting people in a position to condone and say, breaking the law of chastity is okay. It's okay with God. It's no longer not okay. And in 2016, barely half did, 55%. This 11-point erosion of the opposition and corresponding 11-point spike in support from 26 to 37 occurred during the exact period in which the church's official position against same-sex marriage was made abundantly clear through its November 2015 policy changes. Even as the church stiffened in its posture, the rank and file softened theirs, contributing to a growing disconnect between the leadership and the memberships. So I'm going to go right there. Now I have to say, Dr. Reese, I don't agree with what you just said, how you've defined it and wordsmithed that. But I understand what your point you're making. So I'm going to pull this chart out and show you this. If you look at this, there's a graph here. I'm going to hold it up here to the center. Silent generation, 8%. Baby boomers, 2.6%. Generation X, 4.2%. Millennials, 10.5%. Generation Z, 50.8%. Next 20 years, 41.9%. Um, and the next 20 years after that, 82%. In other words, it shows a spike. And if you let it go on, it'll be 100%. I mean, it's just an interesting chart. The trend with Latter-day Saint believers is toward more acceptance of homosexual behavior in marriage, she says. I'm not sure that the, accepting the people who have 
for example, transgender, I think that is a mental challenge. I think that there is a, a dysphoria, a, a problem in the state of mind that thinks I'm, when I'm a male, and yet I think I'm a woman. I'm not saying they don't have that. I'm not saying they feel the feet, don't feel the feelings that they're just sinning in their thinking as an excuse and you know, trying to hide behind. I don't believe that. I think there's literally uh, the challenge mentally there and they need help. But the answer isn't to affirm the identity and say God's law of chastity goes out the window so you can feel right about your identity. It's the law of God. So while acceptance doesn't command majority support, that support has doubled in less than a decade. Define for me, doctor, what you mean by support. This movement is driven in large part by millennials. That's true. More than half of whom say homosexuality should be accepted. Again, are they saying it should be accepted, the state of mind, that it's real, but not be acted on in terms of the lifestyle, the sexual lifestyle of acting it out and breaking the law of chastity? What is support? And among younger millennials like Ellis, whoever she was quoting, those in the 18 to 26 age bracket, 6 in 10 believe it should be. Oh my goodness. By contrast, only 38% of the combined boomer silent generation feels homosexuality should be accepted by society. 38%. Well, that's nearly 40%. That's nearly 4 out of 10 people. So, but that, I would break that down to who believes that it's the state of mind to be accepted, love them and bring them in. It's just like if somebody's lived outside of the church and lived in a way that is way against the standards of the church, but they discover the gospel, they, they are converted to the laws of Christ, they commit to the law of chastity, and they live within its bounds, having broken that commandment before, but being brought in and baptized and have their sins washed away and support them, knowing what their mindset is, to love them where they're at and to accept their challenge with identity, but their efforts to keep the law of chastity, absolutely, I'm right on there, marching right beside them, holding their hand, cheering them on. But to push them in to say, I agree, you can go live the lifestyle and have sex with your girlfriend if you're a girl and have sex with your boyfriend if you're a boy or sex between the two because there's no matter, there's no real gender problem. I do not and we cannot support that. So, boomer silent generation feels homosexuality should be accepted by society. 38%. Wow. A view that is reinforced by many statements from Latter-day Saint church leaders who are themselves of the silent generation or even older. When it comes to sexuality, 95% of all Latter-day Saints ages 18 to 88 consider themselves heterosexual. 95%. With 1% saying they are homosexual and 3% claiming bisexuality. I would call that states of mind. That just describes heterosexual state of mind, homosexual state of mind, and um, bisexual state of mind. If Latter-day Saints millennials, ages 18 through 36, are the only group considered, if you only consider millennials in this, this little division here, 90% say they are heterosexual, 2% homosexual, and what seems to be a very high 7% who are bisexual. When former Latter-day Saint millennials were polled, no longer Latter-day Saints, 83% of those millennials, ex-Latter-day Saints, 83% are heterosexual, 5.5% are homosexual, and 9% are bisexual. Certainly these higher homosexual, bisexual responses, state of minds, may be primary reasons why these folks left the church. Do you think? I think so. Reese writes that it proved difficult to find LGBTQ millennial Latter-day Saints who remain fully active in the church. And I can see that if they're acting it out and, we're, and they're looking for support, that it's okay to uh, be in a sexual relationship when they're a girl with a girl or a boy with a boy or back and forth, they probably have some because it's, I would love them where they're at. I would want to help them and I'd want to encourage them to overcome that and c take charge of that mindset so that you can understand the command of uh, keeping the law of chastity and what it would mean for you and their spiritual uh, guidance in, in, in life, but I won't support that lifestyle. Perhaps most surprising is the current Latter-day Saint support of the church, she says, for its policy concerning the homosexual issue. A total of 71% agree that members who are involved in same-sex marriages are apostates who should be automatically subjected to a membership disciplinary council. I've been in disciplinary council, they're now called membership councils, and, and I understand what's being said here. I personally it's, it's, it's for the stake present to make that judgment. And uh, I don't have an immediate feeling they're apostate, get them out of here. That's not where my heart is. My heart is, 
Let's love them where they're at. Let's encourage them. Let's help them. Let's pray with them. Let's pray for them. Let's um, answer their questions. Give the listening ear. Spend the time with them. Make friends and get to know them. And help them. Help them to learn about why God set in place the law of chastity. It's one of the five covenants that we make in the temple. Sacrifice, obedience, the law of the gospel, chastity. Chastity, number four, and then consecration. And so there's lots that's going to be required of them that includes this Clean, clean hands and a pure heart that's tied to the law of chastity. So I would help them. I don't just say, remove them, they're apostate. That's just not my heart. In November 2015, the Latter-day Saint Church decided to ban children of LGBTQ parents for being able to get baptized or blessed until they turned 18. This angered many fo uh, vocal, vocal excuse me, Latter-day Saints with the church rescinding this policy in April of 2019. So three and a half, four years, maybe five, five years, uh, yeah, three and a half years later. It turns out that those Latter-day Saints, Dr. Reese says, who were angered are not the majority. In fact, 61% of all current Latter-day Saints strongly or at least somewhat agree with the policy in this polled group, with the average speeding um, over all the generations. For Generation X, it was 62%, and for Millennials, it was 60%, both of which were consistent with the Boomers' silent generations at 63%, all writing their 60 to 63%. Dr. Reese says, there seems to be no doubt that the church made changes to that policy in 2019 in hopes of appeasing disgruntled members. That's her quote. That's not my quote. In fact, I disagree with that characterization by Dr. Reese. That's not how the prophets work. I'm, I'm sorry, but according to his survey that she took, those most unhappy with the policy had already left the church. In fact, of those who remained members, there were a higher number who strongly agreed 37% males and 35% females versus those who disagreed or strongly disagreed at 18% males and 28% females. The question is, with this change that was made in 2019, does it convince, uh, did it convince those former uh, Latter-day Saints to return to the fold? That change in direction? It, it is highly doubtful, she says. So now, number 12, spirituality and evangelism. LDS millennials are very spiritual, she says, with 84% praying at least once a week and 70% reading the scriptures at least once a week, both of which were higher than gener Generation Xers. Once a week praying, I mean, this is not a pet Ben Gay attack on myself, what I'm going to say. But my wife and I pray at least two or three times a day together, and uh, at least three times on our meal, so there are six, and two or three times in our own studies in the morning and in the evenings, and then our close off the day night, Daily, daily, and especially when we're in the heat of the battle with struggles and pains where we have a constant prayer in our heart and we stop and we pray and get quiet time and study time more throughout the afternoon because we're praying to get answers, reading scriptures so we can hear the answers, all that daily, daily, and look at oneself repenting daily. And to me, that's not a pat on the back. That's what God's asked us to be. That's what's needed to have faith in these things so that I'm not a 40% out of a 100%. Anyhow, so this, this LDS millennials are very spiritual with 84% praying at least once a week. I guess you had to come up with some divider there to see, okay, here's the question, but my goodness. Millennials also have the highest rates of literal belief in the scriptures of any generation. 45% agree that the scriptures are the word of God and are to be taken word for word, almost a 10-point jump over the boomer silent group. This is an interesting and somewhat surprising development, she says, given the clear downward generational trend on this same question and research by Pew and Gallup. In those studies, the oldest respondents profess the most literal belief in the scriptures and millennials the least. Both Generation Xers and millennials say that they are evangelistic minded. In fact, 60% of Latter-day Saint millennials share their faith daily or once a week compared to 56% of Generation Xers. That's, 10, that's a 6% higher than that. And only 45% of the boomers' silent generation. I guess we're more shy, or, or I don't know, I, if that's what the group said. Dr. Reese says the high numbers for LDS millennials might be due to the fact that they served their missions in the last two decades. So for them, sharing their faith may simply feel more natural because they doing so all day long on their mission. Every day was a recent experience, in other words. There was not been that long since they had their mission. Mine's a half a century ago. However, she did admit that the survey did not ask what is meant in sharing your faith. 
as she theorized that it's possible that social media comes into play here. Millennials might consider reposting an inspirational meme to count for doing missionary work, uh, evangelizing, okay? That's an example. What is very confusing in church attendance, eight out of 10 LDS millennials say they attended religious services at least weekly. Yet only 47% reported that they attended Sunday church meetings in the last 30 days. Such a discrepancy doesn't make any sense at all unless they are attending other churches. Interesting. Number 13, the Word of Wisdom. Dr. E says the help code as described in the Latter-day Saint scriptures, Doctrine and Covenants 89, is not something adhered to by many Latter-day Saints. Despite the fact that abstaining from tobacco, hot drinks, and alcohol is still demanded by ecclesiastical leaders. Demanded. And her choice of words just kind of gets into my skin a little bit because it is a, a directive from God. It's certainly a commandment. But demanding. you got to do that. That's, not, that's how I see demand is. Maybe she has a different view of what demand is, so she's using that word under her mindset of what it means. But to me, uh, it is still required. There is the word for me, required by ecclesiastical leaders because it's required by the Savior who is the, the, the head of the church and he set all these commandments in motion. He set the high uh, standard. He set the high demands on us, not us. For instance, four out of 10, 40% temple recommend holders consumed at least one of the Word of Wisdom's banned substances in the past six months. <laughs> I don't mean to laugh at that, but just hear what I just said. 40%. Temple recommend holders. What does that mean if they did that and they're temple recommend holders? Give it some thought. This is especially noteworthy, she says, because Latter-day Saints are required to report to a church leader that they are faithful keepers of the word of wisdom to qualify for a temple recommend. Some people may be less than truthful in the recommend interview. If that statistic's true, do you think some 40 out of the 100? Some people may be less than truthful or they are interpreting. Twisting into a pretzel the what they mean by banned substances. The word of wisdom with a certain amount of flexibility. The stats for those who have partaken of banned substances seem to be very high in her estimation. Our survey data shows that about a third of current Latter-day Saints report consuming coffee, 35%, while a quarter, 25%, have drunk alcohol or non-herbal teas, 25%. Let me stop here and say something for a moment. The churches, not the temples, but the ward houses, the buildings we attend church, that is a spiritual hospital. And all these things that she's talking about here, we all come with our baggage, our um, habits, our um, challenges with coffee or with sex or with pornography or with um, tea or cigarettes. I mean, some members I know, they smell cigarettes, and they move and sit on another side of the pew. I love them to come and sit right by me. Because I'm there to get healed just like they're to get healed. So good honk in the morning. Let's be real about this. Using these statistics, I'm going to read them. But please don't think that that judgment, there are some that do. Because we're all on a spectrum of lovability. We're all on a spectrum of acceptance. We're all on a spectrum of judgment. And we are over somewhere here over to the far right that we're judging anything and everything all the time. And everything. I had a sweet lady I was... Um, becoming a minister too, you know, home teach, but ministering too. And she was in her early 30s and she finally started to come back and trusted me. And the first thing a woman said down the hall, she was coming into Relief Society is, boy, that short skirt. You need to go home and change. My goodness, a Latter-day Saint. But then I had to stop and say, I love that woman too. She's on the spectrum. She doesn't understand or she should know better. And that nearly rocked that young woman. So I said, let's forgive her together. I didn't take the hit. You did. That's a fiery dart. You're going to need to continue to get a stronger shield. But love her where she's at. And, and let. And hopefully she'll come to love you where you're at because we're all here to be healed and growing. But that's just an example. That happens all the time. That's part of that offense that people leave the church for. Okay, 26% of Latter-day Saint respondents reported that they have not wholly abstained from alcoholic beverages. Nearly 17% of Latter-day Saint respondents in the NMS this survey smoked or chewed tobacco. Ding, ding. I don't think they do it at church. We don't have platoons, spittoons there all around for the kids that, which is slightly higher than the GSS result of 13% among Latter-day Saints. About one in 10 consumed marijuana. One out of 10. Here is a chart that shows the word of wisdom. Let me see if I can find that. Right here. Yeah. I'll let you look at that for a while. 
I can send this to you as well. Let me read it. Generation Boomer Silent, 24% consumed caffeinated coffee, 24% caffeinated tea, 14% alcohol, decaffeinated coffee, 8%, marijuana, 4%, and tobacco, 9%. Okay, we're all going to the hospital, aren't we? Uh, Generation X, 40% caffeinated coffee, caffeinated tea, 23%, alcohol, 3%, and decaffeinated coffee, 14.5%, and marijuana, 7%, and tobacco, 18 Millennials, 39% caffeinated coffee, uh, Caffeinated tea, 27%, alcohol, 38, 28%, and decaffeinated coffee, 17%, and marijuana, 16%, and tobacco, 23%. Now, I'm not making judgment here except to say that, you know, we're all on the spectrum. We're all trying to overcome the flesh. We're all trying to figure this out. And when you take people out of the gospel, are they all born in the church from the time they were taught at little three years old, going to a little Sunday school, you know, uh, nursery and then coming along and they've all the way to their adult life no these are people from all walks of life that these statistics are coming in I would have loved to have the backgrounds of all 1400 people so that this can be more of a, a, a dead-on more truthful analysis of what we're covering here anyhow generation Xers and LDS Millennials have the highest usage rates of banned substances banned substances causing Reese to conclude that the younger Latter-day Saints don't tie word of wisdom of observance with their Latter-day Saint identity as closely as other Latter-day Saints do that is in my opinion such a twisted way of saying what she just discovered what the debt see this is why interpretations are so different when we receive data scientific data can have all sorts of eyes and angles and people's interpretation of it this was dr beast's interpretation what i just read it's not mine meanwhile coffee alternatives such as decaffeinated 14 percent or postum four percent have lower rates than regular coffee 35 percent duh we're talking about coffee and the addictive taste of that and the normalcy and culture of that come on with this information we one could uh, wonder what the church's 10th president, Joseph Fielding Smith, would have thought about this epidemic of ignoring DNC 89. Again, ignoring. I'm sure there are some small number, but I don't think they're ignoring. I think they hear it in their heart every day when they succumb to these things. They're, taking, they're wanting to change. It's not easy to change. It's not easy to repent of these physical, addictive type things. You've got to give some people some baby room, some baby step space. Come on. Come on, but to, to identify it as an epidemic and ignoring, I, I'm sorry, I don't agree. Salvation and a cup of tea. You cannot neglect little things. Oh, a cup of tea is such a little thing. It is so little, surely it doesn't much, amount to much. Surely the Lord will forgive me if I drink a cup of tea. Yes, he will forgive you because he is going to forgive every man who repents. But, my brethren, if you drink coffee or tea or take tobacco, are you letting a cup of tea or a little tobacco stand in the robe and bar you from the celestial kingdom of God where you might otherwise have received a fullness of joy that's in doctrines of salvation. She would pull that out of there. I think it's out of context, but I, I won't go any further on that. Number 14, popular culture. Over the past few decades, especially the last four or five generations, the Latter-day Saint Church has battled popular culture. Every society has battled popular culture. Good honk in the morning. The ban of activities labeled inappropriate by the church appear to be ignored, more ignored by the younger generations. Consider those activities deemed unacceptable by the church, but heavily participated in by Latter-day Saints in the last six months, including, there's another one. Let's look at that. This one here is a chart that those activities deemed unacceptable by the church, but heavily participated in by members in the last six months. Heavily participated, deemed unacceptable. Generation Boomer Silent, 6% for violent graphic video games, 6% for profane sexually ex explicit music, R-rated movies, 28%, TV with mature rating, 37%, soft porn, 7%, illicit, illicit excuse me, explicit porn, 5%. Generation Xers, 26% violent video games, uh, sexually explicit music, profane music, 25%, R-rated movies, 40%, 4 out of 10, TV with mature rating, 43.5%, soft porn, 14%, explicit porn, 11%, millennials, 35% violent graphic video games, 37% sexually explicit music, R-rated movies, 42%, TV with mature rating, 40%. Soft porn, 19%. Explicit porn, 18.5%. That is an interesting set of facts. While it is true that a majority of Latter-day Saints do avoid these types of behaviors, 
Thank you for that little grace there, doctor. The numbers for the younger generation show a higher propensity for ignoring the guidelines set by the church. I suppose you can define it ignoring. I just feel they may be struggling with it because we live in a different time. I remember when I was 17, 16, 17, in a football locker room, I played middle linebacker for Boise Braves in Boise, Idaho. And there were, I was a minority of just a handful of Latter-day Saints and all the rest weren't. And the men in there and the laughter they did, they would put out little gum cards, you know, bubble gum pornographic card or a, or a magazine that was hidden in plastic by, by the check stand and hidden from the view. That's not our world today. Good gracious, it's in your face constantly. And just, just it comes on to a little feed and boom, there and you get out and there and more and more. You can look and look and click and look and watch. And there's just anything and everything. So do you think they got a little bit more problem? Be fair, be fair. The rational for the higher numbers for millennials compared to the boomer and silent generations is obvious. For example, most boomers and silent generations did not grow up with a culture saturated with violent graphic videos or profane sexual explicit music, unless I Want to Hold Your Hand by the Beatles would count in that genre, <laughs> okay, or genre. But these things certainly have been prevalent in the 21st century, like I just described, which is why seven times more millennial Latter-day Saints Seven times more millennial Latter-day Saints are likely to have participated in those activities when contrasted to the boomer silent generation. So what does that say to you? I know what it says to me. We've got to love these people more. We've got to help them. We've got to not accept their behavior, their, their, their uh, victimhood, because they're victims of this, no question. And it creates addictiveness, and we're created to have passions and to put uh, controls and barriers and... and uh, uh, we have, I have my, uh, what, I'm trying to think of the word, you know, boundaries, try to help them set boundaries for themselves so they're not constantly attacked on this, but it takes some time. Don't throw the baby out of the, with the wash. Love them, baby step by baby step. So, in addition, pornography for those who are now over 50 years old, I'm over 50 by 20 years, with fewer hormones today, I don't know about that, just kidding, was usually limited to magazines with plastic wrap and kept in full eyesight of the liquor store owner, like I said. Or, if one's parents had money, there may have been access to risque cable television channels back then, not in my home, I barely had black and white TV. Today, however, it is possible to find pornography on a home computer or cell phone, giving a person more privacy to indulge in their lust than ever before. Total privacy. This has to be why millennial Latter-day Saints were almost four times as likely to deal with this temptation than their elders and even 50% more likely than Generation Xers. That is an understatement, and that is a plague of our time. Fifteenth, temple interview questions. Meanwhile, when it comes to tattoos, close to a quarter of the Latter-day Saint millennials say they have at least one tattoo, while more than a third of non-Latter-day Saint millennials have been inked. Inked. This is still higher than the rate the LDS Church would presumably like to see, which is zero. Yeah, I hope you understand why. If you don't, do a little research on it. Anyhow, 16th, social and political views. Generally speaking, Latter-day Saints are more conservative in their political views than the rest of American society. Do you think? As a majority of Latter-day Saints vote or lean Republican. I'll tell you what I'll vote. I vote my conscience. If there was a my conscious uh, party, I'm, sign me up. That's what I'd be because I vote by my conscience. I'm prayerful and I don't go by... Uh, groups. I had too many things happen while I was a Republican or otherwise, and I was fooled. And uh, you don't, you can fool me the first time, but you're not going to fool me again. And I moved early on in my youth as a young husband to become a vote by conscious uh, voter. However, the younger generations are more likely to be more liberal and democratic. Recent writes LDS millennials are actually almost as likely to lean or vote Democratic, 41%, as Republican, 46%. Whereas in Generation X, the GOP carries the day by a nearly 2 to 1 margin, 59% to 29%, 59% who do, 29% who don't. And the boomer silent cohort, me, tends to, uh, trends, trends even more decisively Republican, 68% to 25%. When it comes down to the final vote, maybe, maybe, but not in the research, not in what I stand for, not in what I've looked and observed and watched and what these two parties are doing or not doing. But when it comes down to pulling the lever, 
Uh, it's usually the lesser of two evils. Good honk in the morning. What a sad day this is. When it comes to Latter-day Saint views on issues facing Americans, millennials disagree with their fellow boomer silent generation X generations. For example, the combined category of poverty, hunger, and homelessness is the largest concern for millennials, with 30% saying it is a crucial issue. It is only the sixth most important issue for the boomer silent generation as well as the generation Xers. Meanwhile, the older generation said the top problems are moral and religious decline, 41% and 34% respectively, whereas it was only the third issue on the table for millennials at 27%. All these mindsets, these belief systems, another major difference included health care as the second most important issue for the boomers' silent generations, 31%, while it was only seventh for the millennials, 22%, and eighth for generation extras, 21%. Health care issues are more of a concern for the older respondents, duh, little creeks and patch patch here and patch patch there. Of course it's concern for us, which makes sense since those folks are in the last half. I'm glad he gave it the last half. That means I got another 50 years or 35 years of their lives and need affordable medical care to survive. As far as changing moral and social views, millennial Latter-day Saints are more likely to not think certain behaviors are immoral compared to the older generations. Perhaps their favorite go-to verse is Matthew 7, 1, which says, judging not whenever possible. Judge not that you be not judged. It's that, um, um, what's the word? being caring about other people. There's a word for it that slipped my mind. This chart shows how many Latter-day Saints thought it was morally wrong to do the following things. So there's that chart. Let me get that one. Give me a chance to look at that. You can pause it and watch it. But anyhow, here's a chart showing how many Latter-day Saints thought it was morally wrong to do the following things. Silent Boomer, have an abortion, 83% thought it was wrong. Have an affair, 95% thought it was wrong. Have a baby outside of marriage, 74%. Have more than one wife, 76%. Have a sex change, 78%. Generation Xers, have an abortion, 75%. Have an affair, 93%. Having a baby outside of marriage, 66%. Having more than one wife, 68%. Have a sex change, 69%. Millennials, have an abortion, 65%. So that means there was 35%. They said, okay. Have an affair, 79%. Have a baby outside of marriage, 58%. Have more than one wife, 63%. And have a sex change, 62%. Interesting statistics that we're dealing with today in our culture. Still, in another survey, Latter-day Saint millennials proved to be the least accepting of any generation. Consider the number of folks who think it is morally wrong to do the following things. Let me show you this. To do these following things is wrong. Okay? I'm not going to read those. Stop and pause it. Stop and pause it and read it. And I'm going to go on. I'm going a little bit too long here, so let me continue. Certainly, the high Latter-day Saint millennial responses to wearing fur and the death penalty could have been easily predicted, but the other higher responses, including stem cell research, having a vasectomy and getting a divorce, are surprising, she says. Seventeenth point is sources of authority. Latter-day Saint leaders are very clear that what they say should be taken seriously. However, when individual Latter-day Saints were polled, and this polling of 14 people, non longer Latter-day Saint and Latter-day Saints, when they were polled, the general authorities came in fifth on the list of authority. The top five were unconscience, promptings from the Spirit, family members, scriptures, and lastly, general authorities. Well, I would shuffle that a little bit, but anyhow, each to their own. It would seem that one's own conscience and promptings from the Spirit are closely related with both based on one's feelings. Yet the Bible says, now here's, here was the interesting. This is a Latter-day Saint uh, woman putting in the Christian um, evangelical point. She says, yet the Bible says the trusting in feelings should be avoided. Jeremiah 17, 9 states, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Proverbs 28, 26 says, He that trusteth in his own heart is a fool, but whoso walketh wisely, he shall be delivered. And Proverbs 14, 12 adds, There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That's so out of context. I don't have it. It's a whole hour on itself of that point. But I'm going to go on. When it comes to the general authorities finishing in a distant fifth place, Dr. Reese explains that half of the respondents didn't have Latter-day Saint general authorities in their top five. As we might expect, highly orthodox members were the most likely to do so. That's me, I suppose. You can call me the orthodoxy guy. You can talk to me about a believer in the high-demand religion. Better than no demand at all. 
Perhaps respondents may have thought, I'll accept the brethren whenever my personal conscience and the promptings from the Spirit to my soul agree. Moving themselves and their opinions into a higher position than the GAs, these men are apparently not in the position of power that they might think they're in. Well, that to me, is starting to reveal even more and more Dr. Reese's mindset. You know, talking about these men, they don't have the power they think they might have. That's a disrespectful statement in my mind. Even family members landed above both the standard works and the general authorities. Reese agrees how shocking this is. Okay, now she says it's shocking. Given how essential the Council of Latter-day Saint general authorities is concerning their LDS life, I was expecting to see church leaders at the top of the list for Latter-day Saints in general, with some possible dilution of their importance in the lives of younger respondents. Do you think that maybe it wasn't explained clearly? It was like most surveys, you're left with choices that doesn't quite land right. Prophetic counsel is one of several sources they consult when making moral decisions, but is hardly the only one. In fact, half of the respondents didn't have Latter-day Saint general authorities in their top five. When it comes to the general authorities, the boomer silent generations were much more likely to put Latter-day Saint general authorities higher at 17% compared to the less than 10% for the millennials. Wow. Regarding watch and watching general conference, fewer than half of the millennials tune in to the biannual sessions, 44%, compared to Generation Xers at 51%, Boomers at 65%, and Silent Generation, 78%. For me, they don't have nothing to do because they're 80 years old in their rockathon chair, and so they'll watch the conference. I don't know. I'm being facetious there. Why? The why is a question. Even though the wards pretty much shut down those two weekends a year so congregants can participate. Why are most Latter-day Saint millennials not tuning in while the majority of other ages groups are? Reese gives her analysis saying, one possibly is that they don't see themselves represented. They don't see the young apostles up there. When members of the silent generation watch, they are guaranteed to see and hear men from their own generation. Baby boomers, too, can find kindred spirits of their own age in the members of the quorum and a majority of the 70s and exerly leaders who also speak. This is not the case for generations and Xers and millennials who will be hard-pressed to find any leaders from their generations. Duh, do you think? I mean... Think that one through. Think that one through. Number 18, Latter-day Saints who leave the church. Perhaps the most interesting part of the survey for me was former Latter-day Saints' religious beliefs. According to the surveys, 42% of those who leave the church still believe in God with no doubts. This seems to be a very encouraging number, especially with the number of former members we meet who no longer believe in God or at least say they are agnostic. So her little survey said 40% and that encouraged her. So she continues. Meanwhile, 20% believe in God but sometimes doubt. 18% believe in a higher power. 8% are agnostic. 6% are atheist. And 6% believe sometimes. How does that work? I believe sometimes. No, I don't. Wiffle, waffle, waffle, wiffle. Things are going well, and you believe in God. Then things don't go so well, so they go south, and then you deny God's existence. Maybe that's what she's talking about. In reality, it has seemed that a higher number of former Latter-day Saints have headed to atheistic, agnostic ways. That I believe. Could that impression come mainly because those types of dissatisfied people are more adamant in stating their opinion? Maybe, maybe to see that close to half of former Latter-day Saints believe in God with no doubts is very encouraging to those of us who want to see Latter-day Saints after leaving their church to at least come to a personal relationship with Christ. In effect, we don't want disgruntled and dissatisfied Latter-day Saints throw the proverbial baby out with the bathwater, like I said. She continues, While many former members still believe in biblical teachings, such as Jesus Christ was literally resurrected, 53%, Jesus is the Savior of the world, 58%, and God is real, 63%, most of them denied essential Latter-day Saint teachings. The third did still hold to God being comprised of flesh and bone, however, but less than a quarter believed other important teachings of the Latter-day Saints. Consider the following chart. So this is my last chart here. You can pause that and look at that. Okay. It's quite an interesting chart as well on the doctrine. God is an ex exalted person of flesh and bone. 16% believe it's true. 17%, and you know, it's just an interesting chart of thoughts. Again, more than half of all Latter-day Saints seems to want to include the reality of God and Jesus while rejecting unique essential Latter-day Saint teachings that have no basis in biblical fact. Perhaps some of this skepticism in Latter-day Saint teachings should be credited to the Gospel Topics Essays, a series of 13 articles that has been eye-opening to many once serious Latter-day Saints. 
Once they began to doubt some of the essentials of their faith, as listed in the chart above that I just showed, it appears that their doctrinal world crashes down. Their shell collapses, is what she's referring to. Fewer than half of former Latter-day Saints have not become involved with another religious tradition since they left their faith. A total of 20%, 21%, excuse me, consider themselves just Christian, while 10% move to evangelical Protestant and 7% mainline Protestants. Those who have chosen nothing in particular is 27%, with only 18% choosing agnostic or atheist. This list of reasons why Mormons leave the church came from respondents who were allowed to provide more than one response, as I thought. The results were fascinating. One, I could no longer reconcile my personal values and priorities with those of the church, 38%. I stopped believing there was one true church, 36.5%. I did not trust the church leaders to tell the truth surrounding controversial and historical issues, 31%. I felt judged and misunderstood, 30%. Now, these are 32% out of respondents, okay? So, out of, uh, say, 1,500, 30%. Or uh, 500 didn't, okay? Anyhow, I'll, I'll continue on. Based on the personal experiences that I had, the two re uh, reasons current members often assume for why most people leave the LDS Church is they couldn't keep the commandments, 6 above. Or 11, I was hurt by a neighbor experience in the church, 17%. Neither of those two choices made it to the top five. In this day, 11th President Harold B. Lee explains, People apostatize due to ignorance or sin, is what he said. This is what she's quoting. In nine cases out of ten, nine out of ten, I'd say in every case, those who apostatize from the church do it from one of two reasons, either because of their ignorance of the doctrine. And let me define what I think he meant by that. Didn't study daily, didn't pray daily, once a month, didn't go to church daily. They didn't really study the gospel, read good religious church books by the apostles and consumed and learned and prayed and fasted and followed the principles so that they'd receive the spiritual guidance they need so they were ignorant of the doctrine of the atonement they believed in a different way they believed in a simplistic way and then they had a fall in a sense and now in complexities and the complexities overwhelmed them so their ignorance you know ignorance is not um stupidity stupidity is you once you buy grab a hold of an electric fan <laughs> And you let go. Stupidity is grabbing it again when you know it's stupid. Okay? Ignorance is just not knowing. And so, yeah, there are a lot that are not knowing of the doctrine or because they are sinless, excuse me, sinfulness and falling away from the truth. Their sinfulness. I don't know. Maybe that's uh, an either or is what he's given here. I don't think so. I think the sinfulness is just not wicked things. It's, it's doing things that doesn't uplift yourself, that doesn't bring the peace and the light that you're seeking. I take exception to the idea that she's putting here, even in his day, that most members who leave the church, she's saying, is due to ignorance. Instead, it is knowledge and understanding that causes dissatisfaction and divorce from the church. Okay, knowledge and understanding. Dr. Reese, knowledge of what? Knowledge of untruths and understanding of false expressions by our critics. Yeah, I guess that does cause cognitive dissonance, hearing that there's, oh my goodness, there's five accounts of the first vision. Oh, the church isn't true. They lied. I never heard that growing up. Is that knowledge and understanding that's causing dissatisfaction? No, that's a lack of knowledge and a misunderstanding of the truths that cause cognitive dissonance and dissatisfaction and divorce from the church. I'm sorry, this woman, uh, bless her heart, but she's wrong here. She's not clearly... Um, understood the survey herself. Meanwhile, other doctrinal or historical issues included were Joseph Smith's polygamy, issues with the first vision, teachings on the possibility of becoming gods, blacks in the priesthood, seer stones, DNA evidence that Native Americans do not have Middle Eastern ancestry. All of these have been answered. My goodness. Let me return to number two, she says. I stopped believing there was one uh, true church. It appears that many Latter-day Saints are not entirely convinced that there was ever a need for a restoration for biblical Christianity. Although the leaders certainly thought, uh, thought there were needed to be one due to the corruption of biblical Christianity soon after the death of the apostles. So the end of the first century and being fixed in the second and third through the third, uh, fifth centuries. During that time is where they really locked in and then the government came together with Catholicism and it was... It was a mess. Murder and beheadings and burn at the stake. Oh, my goodness. By the ecclesiastical leaders who were government leaders. It's quite a display of Satan's power uh, that he was going to rule blood and horror. Anyhow, yes, there was an apostasy. 
She says, consider what Latter-day Saint Seventy and church historian B.H. Roberts explained. Nothing less than a complete apostasy from the Christian religion would warrant the establishment of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. I say that water got discolored, even trying to put uh, purification things. It's got to be washed out and put all brand new water in. Cisterns that are pure, that water pure can hold. God the Son told Joseph Smith, excuse me, this is because there was no authority after the great apostasy, as Joseph Smith himself was told by Jesus Christ in the first vision. 13th President Ezra Taft Benson taught this, quote, sorry, I better slow down. God the Son told Joseph Smith not to join any of the churches. Joseph was to learn that the Lord's true church was not on the earth at that time, that living prophets of God, who were the foundation of the church, had not walked the earth for centuries, and that with their deaths, the rock of revelation on which the church was built ceased, and so there was no new scripture. This quote is found to uh, in Listen to the Prophet's Voice, Ensign, uh, January 1973, page 58. The 10th president of the church, President Joseph Fieldy Smith, may have assumed too much when he explained, this is her saying, assume too much. It's not me saying, she says, every Latter-day Saint knows that following the death of the apostles, Paul's prophecy was fulfilled, for there were many grievous woes that entered the flock, and men arose speaking perverse things, so that the doctrines were changed, and the true church of Jesus Christ ceased to be on the earth. Paul talked about his bishops and leaders right there turning on him. They were already started when he was before he was killed by Nero. For this reason, there had to come a restoration of the church and new revelation bestowal of a divine authority. The church of Jesus Christ and the Holy Scriptures are therefore not responsible for the change doctrines and unscientific teachings of those times when uninspired ecclesiastics controlled the thinking of the people, Joseph Fielding Smith, and man, his origin and destiny. Meanwhile, she says, the third most popular answer was that the former member did not trust the church leadership to tell the truth surrounding controversial or historical issues. Earlier I referred to, she says, the gospel topic essays. I wonder if ex Latter-day Saints are using this reason more often in recent years because they realize how their leaders had been lying to them about issues such as Joseph Smith's polygamy, the Book of Mormon seer stones, and the Book of Abraham's Ill illegitimacy, among other topics. She says as though they're facts. Good honk in the morning. Conclusion. The survey clearly shows that the generation Xers and millennial generations are much different in a number of ways when compared to the older generations. It will be interesting to watch how the perspectives of the Gen Xers, millennials, and Gen, Gen Zers generations affect future decisions of the LDS church leaders, she says. Dr. Reese gives her conclusion by saying, and keep in mind it is my sense that even though she is an active member of the church, some of the views she has expressed here are not certainly my views. I am just stating what she said in her book. And I quote, the leaders of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints should we always use Mormon or she always uses Mormon and Mormon. I missed a few and I tried to change those that I caught to put Latter-day Saints in it. But she she used that, I suppose, because that's I don't know why I would have never done that. But anyhow, have the challenge of trying to stay the growth of the thorny societal and doctrinal issues. I call this the thicket of doubt, those thorny societal and doctrinal issues, in other words, which continually alienate, alienate Excuse me, alienate, no, alienate, there's the word, get those words, yep, alienate many of the church's core believers. To some onlookers, it seems that the church is hemorrhaging with many of its members continuing to exit out of the back door while having the lowest rates of conversion percentages in modern history. Church leaders in the past have appeared to be reactionary. For instance, she says, it seems apparent that reversing the 2015 restriction to baptism blessings for children of homosexual parents in 2019, listen to viewpoint on Mormonism's reversing the Revelation part 1, 2, and 3 that aired April 15th, on now, was based on the many complaints the leaders received rather than revelation from God. That's her opinion. In other words, otherwise, how could God have changed his mind so quickly, right? As she's implying, how would he have changed his mind so quickly if it wasn't just they felt the pressure? I don't agree. Also, policy changes such as turning the three-hour Sunday service to just two hours and allowing young missionaries to call home weekly seems to be nothing more than, fee listen to this, feeble attempts, feeble attempts to appease a fickle membership. No judgment here. I'll let you judge for yourself if that's how you describe our apostles and prophets and our first presidency. Feeble-minded men who put forth feeble attempts to appease the fickle members, especially the young members of the church. 
Is this the way the New Testament apostles ran the early church? He says, I hardly think so. Dr. Reese continues saying, I predict that this pragmatic approach, apparently preferred by the leadership, cannot be successful in the long run. If this church is supposed to be a restoration of original Christianity, that's a little dig, as Latter-day Saint scripture and countless leaders have taught, then it seems doubtful that God would care about society's changing ways or the opinions of his followers. If nothing else, this book ought to cause current members to wonder, wonder, wonder excuse me, who is running the program. Do you wonder who's running the program? Men or God? God or men, she said, who claim to be his leaders, who claim to be his leaders. End quote, end of her book, end of her comments. Now, for those who have ears to hear and eyes to see, Dr. Reese's stats are revealing for sure. But what they reveal, in my view, is very different from Dr. Reese's judgment of the hearts and stances of the brethren. To say that they are simply being pragmatic and just dealing with things sensibly and realistically based on the practical rather than on spiritual considerations is just flat wrong. Saying that members should wonder who's running the program is quite revealing of Dr. Beast's mindset, at least it is to me. Implying that the prophets, seers, and revelators only claim to be such, but in actually are being influenced by the whims of the members of the church was offensive to me. I suppose you could tell. And I'm not easily offended. I really am not. When I reflected on Dr. Reese's take on all of these stats gathered from her survey regarding where the hearts and minds of the members of the Church of Jesus Christ are, both former and current members, I found myself remembering the two-part video I watched a couple of years ago titled, Write This Down, We Will Witness What Nephi Saw in Vision, Parts 1 and 2. The video presentations was done by an average Latter-day Saint man, much like myself. His name is Ricky Valdez. He provided a slideshow he put together for his family and friends as part of a family home evening he did. In Ricky's video presentation, he quotes President Russell M. Nelson, the current president and prophet of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. Ricky said, quote, President Nelson quoted one of the most dramatic and pivotal prophecies in the scriptures, seen also by Daniel, John the Revelator, and many other prophets, in which he identified us, members of the church, living right now, here today, as the ones that will live to see it come to pass. Ricky continues and says, This is the greatest prophecy I have ever heard any living prophet ever speak to any generation. And then he invites us to think of that. 1 Nephi 14, 7 says, For the time cometh, saith the Lamb of God, that I will work a great and marvelous work among the children of men, a work which shall be everlasting, either on the one hand or on the other, either to the convincing of them unto peace and life eternal, or unto the deliverance of them to the hardness of their hearts and the blindness of their minds, and to their being brought down into captivity, and also into destruction, both temporally and spiritually, according to the captivity of the devil of which I have spoken. The prophet Nephi saw around the corner, to our time and witness the events and circumstances we're now facing. As we follow the prophet's invitation to think about and ponder this prophecy of Nephi, we will see the sobering truth of it. It's basically saying that all of society will be polarized into two separate sides, two churches, two ideologies. One side aligns themselves with the emerging world government of tyranny, surveillance, and control, and the other side stands for liberty and trust in God for its salvation. The accuser of the brethren, Satan, with his weapon of collectivist ideology, will influence people to feel that they can't be safe until every person is compelled to live the new world religion of global sustainability. This ideology is driving the polarization in our cultural society and bring about an ever-increasing display of evidence and deception in his effort to force everyone to either choose Christ's liberty or choose his captivity. Of all this is an inner overview, excuse me, all of this is an overview of how this process of polarization of culture and societal ills has taken its toll on the past six generations. The greatest generation, the silent generation, the baby boomer generation, the millennial generation, and the Gen Z generation, and the rising generation. Each generation has shown a decline of faith in the members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. That is true. And in particular, how the world society and culture has influenced the beliefs and mindset of each nation's citizenry, both church members and non-members. The polarization, this polarization, is nearly... Uh, reaching its completion. And when it does, all of the remaining signs of the times I've discussed in my last video will have been fulfilled. Current president of the Quorum of the Twelve Apostles, Elder Jeffrey R. Holland, said the following back in November of 1988, 98, excuse me, that's some 25 years ago, and I quote, We are witnessing an ever greater movement toward polarity. The middle ground options will be removed from us as Latter-day Saints. The middle of the road will be withdrawn. 
End of quote. I suggest that we consider Dr. Reese's survey as evidence of the fulfilling of Nephi's prophecy and of the words of Elder Holland. We have been told that the elect would even be deceived as um, this apostasy grows in the lands and in the earth like a flood. President Ezra Tab Benson said, quote, I testify that as the forces of evil increase under Lucifer's leadership and the forces of the good increase under the leadership of Jesus Christ, two churches, two ideologies, two forces, there will be a growing battle between or battles between the two sides until the final confrontation. As the issues become clearer and more obvious, all mankind will eventually be required to align themselves either for the kingdom of God or for the kingdom of the devil. That's General Conference, October 1988. I just covered 20 of these issues right here. I'll pause and let you look at that. You can ask for that. It shows the left, the right, intellectual and practical, and all the different issues that arise and how they have affected the world as well as members of the church over these past six generations, each of whom has had some of its generations leave the church and abandon the face of their youth. All of this was foretold. All of it was foretold by holy prophets, both past and present. David O. McKay taught the two contending forces. Those forces are known and have been des designated by different terms throughout the ages. In the beginning, they were known as Satan on the one hand and Christ on the other. In these days, they are called dom dom domination in this, by the state. On, on the other side, personal liberty. On the other, communism on the one hand and free agency on the other. President Benson said, The central issue in the premortal council was, Shall the children of God have untrampled agency to choose the course they should follow, whether good or evil, or shall they be coerced and forced to be obedient? Canceled, if you don't comply. Cancel. The cancel system. The cancel society. The left cancel. Christ and all who followed him stood for the former proposition, freedom of choice. Satan stood for the latter, coercion and force. The war that began in heaven over this issue is not yet over. It's getting close. The conflict continues on the battlefield of morality, or mortality and morality. And one of Lucifer's primary strategies has been to restrict our agency through the power of earthly governments. That's true. Elder Bruce McConkie said, quote, When the Father announced his plan, when he chose Christ as the Redeemer and rejected Lucifer as the Savior, then there was war in heaven. That war was a war of words. It was a conflict of ideologies. It was a rebellion against God and his laws. Lucifer sought to dethrone God, to sit himself on the divine throne, and to save all men without reference to their works. He sought to deny men their agency so they could not sin. He offered a moral, excuse me, a mortal life of carnality and sensuality, of evil evil and crime and murder, following which all men would be saved. Continuing with Elder McConkie's words, and so in the courts of heaven the war with, of wars was waged. Christ and Michael and the mighty hosts of noble and great spirits preached the gospel of God and exhorted their brethren to follow the Father. Lucifer and his lieutenants preached another gospel, a gospel of fear and hate and lasciviousness and compulsion. They sought salvation without keeping the commandments, without overcoming the world without choosing between opposites, and they prevailed not. Neither was their place found any more in heaven. And the great dragon was cast out, that old serpent called the devil, and Satan, which deceiveth the whole world. He was cast out into the earth, and his angels were cast out with him. And his legions, the legions of hell, are everywhere around us. They are the third part of the stars of heaven, one third of the spirit children of the Father, and they were cast out of their heavenly home because of rebellion. And so, the Holy Word says... Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil has come down unto you, having great wrath. And he goes forth to make war with all men, and particularly with those who keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of Jesus Christ. Revelations 12, 14 through 17. And the war that is now going on among men, the war between good and evil, is but a continuation of the war that began in heaven. The saints of the Church of the Lamb are those who stand for individual liberty, trusting in God as the author of human rights and human dignity. They hold fast to the rod of iron, the word of God, the light of Christ within them, and the divine principles set forth in God's political law, the U.S. Constitution. They will receive divine strength by tapping into the power of covenants, including the covenant of America. By a prophet said that. Tighten those anchor pins on that rock and your foundation. Your covenants, those belonging to the church of the devil, seek salvation through the emerging world political system of tyranny, compulsion, surveillance, and regulation. They trust in the arm of the flesh to save them. The fruit of this ide ideology are the issues we've just discussed. I showed that for uh, arrow chart. 
The same war that divided the sons of perdition in the pre-existence will now divide those of a telestial mindset from advancing into the terrestrial millennium. I strongly invite you to select this video from my playlist titled Evidence of the Book of Mormon and watch parts 1 and 2 in their entirety. Once you've done that, you can come back to this video and re-watch my video where I've discussed all these points here regarding why Latter-day Saints have left and are still leaving the church. And I'm confident you will see for yourself the fulfillment of the prophecies the Lord gave His prophets, especially those living today. Although I'm sad that so many of our brothers and sisters of the covenant have stepped away from the ark called the covenant path, having turned to the philosophies of men, it shouldn't surprise any of us. We've been warned and forewarned that this was coming. It's my prayer that each of us will check our covenant anchor pins. If they're loose, if one's fallen and broken, fix it, repair it, tighten it, fix it. That have a bound and, and, and affix it to the Savior, our rock and our Redeemer. So to make sure that yours is tight and as tight as it can, they can be, I tell you, tighten them because the storm is going to get nasty. I so testify in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Love you.